Sherlock Holmes and his loyal friend and assistant Watson went camping together. And after a good hike and a hot meal, they lay down for the night and went to sleep. And some hours later, in the middle of the night, Holmes woke up and he nudged his friend awake. He says, Watson, look up at the sky and tell me what you see. I see thousands of stars, Watson exclaimed. And what does that tell you? Well, Watson, he pondered the question and he said, well... Astronomically, it tells me that there are probably millions of galaxies and probably billions of planets. Astrologically, I observe that Saturn is in Leo. Horologically, I deduce that the time is approximately half past three. Theologically, I can see that God is all-powerful and that we are small and insignificant. Meteorologically, I predict that we will have a beautiful day tomorrow. Does it tell you anything I've missed? Holmes was silent for a moment and then exclaimed, Watson, you're an idiot. Someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> Studying Bible prophecy can be like that. A person can get so focused on certain details, trying to find support for particular views of eschatology, trying to see things that may or may not be there, making connections that may or may not be there, that we miss the really obvious stuff that we should be seeing. Let's flip over to Acts chapter 1 for a moment. Verse 6. It says, then they gathered around him, Jesus, and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, his disciples, it's not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven." The setting of this uh, little passage that we've just read is it, after Jesus was crucified and then resurrected, he spent nearly a month and a half with the disciples, getting them prepared for the work they would be doing after his departure. It's now time for Jesus to leave them. And the disciples, they want to know when Jesus will be coming back to establish his kingdom on the earth. And he tells them that the timing of that is not something for them to know. Only the Father knows the time of Jesus' return. He then refocuses their thinking by telling them that they're going to be given power from the Holy Spirit so that they can carry on the work that he has started and has now given to them to do until he comes back. We have been given the same work to do, and we've been given the whole same Holy Spirit to carry out that work. See, Jesus is coming back one day, and it may be very soon, but he doesn't want us just standing around staring up into the sky looking for him. He wants us to live our lives in hopeful expectation and anticipation for his return while telling others about him. With our words and with our life, the good news that Messiah has come to give us new life. Well, chapter 7 of Daniel begins a new section of the book, which records a number of visions and dreams that Daniel himself had. And we looked at the vision Daniel had in chapter 7 last time. We're going to be in chapter 8 today of Daniel, looking at another dream Daniel had. 
So if you have your Bible, you can flip over to the book of Daniel and you can make your way over to chapter 8. We noted a number of parallels that existed between the dream that Daniel had in chapter 7 and the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had in Daniel chapter 2. The dream in chapter 8, it also shares some of the same parallels with the dreams of chapters 2 and 7. In fact, the dream of chapter 8 can be seen as a subset, a more detailed subset of the dreams of chapters 2 and 7 of Daniel. So, Daniel chapter 8, and we'll begin reading in the very first verse there. It says, In the third year of King Belshazzar's reign, I, Daniel, had a vision after the one that had already appeared to me. Daniel had this vision in the third year of Belshazzar's reign, which means he had this vision about two years after after the vision that he talks about in Daniel chapter 7. It also means that we're going back in time, chronologically, to a time between chapters 4 and chapters 5 of Daniel, about 11 years before the fall of Babylon to the Medes and the Persians. Verse 2, In my vision I saw myself in the citadel of Susa, in the province of Elam, in the vision, I was beside the Ulai Canal. So Daniel's vision begins with him standing beside this canal in the citadel or the fortress city of Susa. At the time of Daniel's vision, the citadel of Susa had very little significance, but it will become a capital city of Persia, and it will also be the home of Esther one day. You might remember Esther and the city where Nehemiah lived before returning to Jerusalem. So this is the same place as uh, mentioned in those other places. And in verse 3, he says, I looked up, and there before me was a ram with two horns standing beside the canal, and the horns were long. One of the horns was longer than the other, but grew up later. I watched the ram as it charged toward the west and the north and the south, no animal could stand against it, and none could rescue from its power. It did as it pleased and became great. So the description of the ram with two horns here, one longer and one uh, shorter, it may sound familiar to you if you were with us when we talked about Daniel chapter 7. The ram represents the same empire that was described in Daniel 7 as the bear who was raised up on one side, Daniel chapter 7, verse 5. This is also the same empire that was represented by the chest of silver on the statue in Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 8, verse 20, which is a little later in the chapter, it tells us that this ram represents the Medo-Persian empire. Daniel 8, 20, the two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Medea, and Persia. The two horns on this ram represent the two powers, Medea and Persia. The one horn being longer than the other represents the Persians who were the dominant half of this union, similar to the bear in chapter 7, which was raised up on one side, also represented the dominant side of Persia. The Medo-Persian Empire would stand for almost 200 years before being defeated by the next major empire, the Greeks, led by Alexander the Great. And that brings us to verse 5. It says, As I was thinking about this, suddenly a goat with a prominent horn between its eyes came from the west, crossing the whole earth without touching the ground. It came toward the two-horned ram I had seen standing beside the canal and charged at it, in great rage, I saw it attack the ram furiously, striking the ram and shattering its two horns. The ram was powerless to stand against it. The goat knocked it to the ground and trampled on it, and none could rescue the ram from its power. The goat became very great, but at the height of its power, the large horn was broken off, and in its place four prominent horns grew up toward the four winds of heaven." 
This goat that attacks the ram, it represents the Greek empire under the leadership of Alexander the Great. And you guys are thinking, how are you getting all this stuff? Well, it explains all this later in the chapter, but I'm moving the interpretation up for you during the dream description, so it's all easier, I think, for us to follow than to have it kind of scattered around in the chapter here. So, you know, don't panic. Think, Jeff, what have you been smoking, dude, to even get these ideas? Okay, I, I'm not making this stuff up, as crazy as it may appear to be. But this goat, it represents the Greek Empire under the leadership of Alexander the Great. And it's the same empire that was represented by the leopard in chapter 7 and the thighs of bronze of the statue in chapter 2. Daniel 8.21, later in this chapter, says the shaggy goat is the king of Greece. See? I didn't make it up. And the large horn between its eyes is the first king, referring to Alexander the Great. And as we mentioned last time, Alexander the Great was known for the swiftness of his attacks upon his enemies. And this is represented in Daniel's vision here when it says it's this goat. It came from the west, crossing the whole earth without touching the ground. This describes this tremendous speed of the Greek advance against its enemies. Then, just as this goat was at the height of its power, this single large horn is suddenly broken off, it says in verse 8. This refers to the unexpected and untimely death of Alexander the Great. He suddenly became mysteriously ill and died at the age of 32 33 years of age, after conquering more of the world than any other individual before him. Alexander became king when he was just 20 years old, and he conquered the world of the time in just 12 years. I mean, really an astonishing accomplishment. Well, in place of this single horn, four prominent horns grew up in its place. These four horns represent the same thing that the four heads represented on the leopard in chapter 7. Four of Alexander's generals divided his empire among them following his death. Daniel 8.22 says, The four horns that replaced the one that was broken off represent four kingdoms that will emerge from his nation but will not have the same power. Verse 9, out of one of them came another horn, which started small but grew in power to the south and to the east and toward the beautiful land. It grew until it reached the host of the heavens and it threw some of the starry hosts down to the earth and trampled on them. It set itself up to be as great as the commander of the army of the Lord. It took away the daily sacrifice from the Lord in his sanctuary and was thrown down. Because of rebellion, the Lord's people and the daily sacrifice were given over to it. It prospered in everything it did, and truth was thrown to the ground. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another holy one said to him, How long will it take for the vision to be fulfilled? The vision concerning the daily sacrifice, the rebellion that causes desolation, the surrender of the sanctuary, and the trampling underfoot of the Lord's people. He said to me, It will take 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary will be reconsecrated. So another horn grows up out of one of the four horns of this goat. And it started out small, but it grows to become very powerful, it tells us here. It, it, it grows towards the south, toward the east, and toward the beautiful land. The beautiful land refers to the land of God's people, Israel. And I, I just want to pause for just a moment and think about that. I love how Daniel refers to the land of Israel as the beautiful land. This is where his heart longs to be. It, it's his true homeland. This is the land that God had given to Daniel's people. And for us who are believers and followers of Jesus, heaven is our beautiful land. It's, it's where our hearts long 
for us to be. It is our true homeland, the beautiful land. It's the place of God's glory, the special place that he has prepared for his people. So think about this imagery of the beautiful land. I just like that picture that Daniel creates for us in that. Well, returning to his dream here, this, this horn refers historically to an individual, Antiochus Epiphanes, the king of the Syrian Empire, which was one of the four smaller empires that had resulted from the division of Alexander the Great's Greek Empire. He gave himself the title Epiphanes, which means God manifest, which gives you some clue of this man's ego. He even claimed to be the Greek god Zeus in human flesh. Well, during Antiochus Epiphanes' rule, Jerusalem was the setting for some of the most blasphemous acts ever committed against God by a human being as he attempted to stamp out the Jewish religion. In an attempt to enforce cultural uniformity, among all of the peoples of his kingdom, Antiochus Epiphanes tried to eliminate the practice of the Jewish religion entirely. He wanted everyone to be a Greek, and that meant you were required to abandon whatever you used to be. Well, that was not really a big deal for many people, but for the Jews, it was a very big deal. It was unacceptable, and they refused to do it. He ordered the slaughtering of thousands of Jewish men and women and children. He massacred some 80,000 people as he raged against the Jews and their religion, trying to stamp out the God of the Jews. He even went so far as to erect an idol of Zeus in the temple in Jerusalem, and he desecrated the temple altar by sacrificing pigs on it. These actions became known uh, among the Jews as the abomination of desolation. This was a type, a foreshadowing of the future defiling and the abomination that will take place in the last days under the Antichrist. And this is why we talk about these things. These two holy ones are angels that appear in Daniel's dream. One of them asks the other how long the persecution of God's people being described here in the desecration of the temple will last. And the other one answers, it will be 2,300 evenings and mornings. Judah Maccabee, the son of a Jewish priest, led a Jewish rebellion against the blasphemous Antiochus Epiphanes. And in 164 B.C., took back Jerusalem and purified and rededicated the temple. Do you know what holiday the Jews have to commemorate that event? Hanukkah. That is the story behind Hanukkah. So the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah commemorates Judas Maccabees and uh, the Jews with him who rebelled and overthrew uh, Epiphanes, Antiochus Epiphanes and taking back Jerusalem and purifying and rededicating the temple. Antiochus Epiphanes, he died mysteriously not long after that. The story is told that after Antiochus Epiphanes heard the disturbing news of the defeat of his army by the Maccabean rebels, he began to shout blasphemous threats against the Jews and their God. He was suddenly seized, it says, with severe abdominal pains, which caused him to fall out of the chariot that he was riding, severely injuring himself. It says he eventually died then as worms ate away at his bowels. It said that there was a terrible stench coming from him as he lay in his bed, slowly dying, literally being consumed by worms from the inside out. <laughs> That's nasty. Daniel 8.25 says he will be destroyed, but not by human power. God struck Antiochus Epiphanes down. Now verse 15, 
It says, while I, Daniel, was watching the vision and trying to understand it, there before me stood one who looked like a man, and I heard a man's voice from the Ulai calling, Gabriel, tell this man the meaning of the vision. The angel Gabriel is instructed here to explain the meaning of the vision to Daniel. This is the first time in the Bible that an angel is mentioned by name. And this same angel, Gabriel, is also the messenger who will announce the births of John the Baptist and Jesus in Luke chapter 1. The only other angel besides Satan mentioned in the Bible by name is Michael. You can hang on to that as a little bit of trivia. Trivia one of these days when you're in a Bible trivia game and you can bust out with, well, you know, the first angel mentioned in the Bible was Gabriel. And there's only two, Gabriel and Michael, mentioned by name. Verse 17 says, As he came near the place where I was standing, I was terrified and fell prostrate. Son of man, he said to me, understand that the vision concerns the time of the end. Daniel, he reacts to the appearance of the angel Gabriel in the same way that others who see a real angel in the Bible also react. He's terrified and he falls on the ground hoping the angel doesn't turn him into a piece of human toast. And this is quite a contrast, isn't it, from the cute chubby little cherubs that are commonly depicted in popular culture? Real angels are nothing like that. It's unfortunate the way our culture tends to dumb down spiritual realities to fit its own limitations and lack of imagination. The spiritual is turned into superstitions and bad imitations of physical things and fuzzy Hallmark cards. The real spiritual realm is overwhelming and filled with both glory and terror, unlike anything in this physical world that we regularly dwell in. Well, Gabriel says, understand that the vision concerns the time of the end. And this gives us a clue that what we see with Antiochus Epiphanes is a precursor to what will happen in larger degree with the Antichrist at the end of human rule. That he is a precursor and a type and, and a just gives us an idea of what's coming, a taste of it. Verse 18, while he was speaking to me, I was in deep sleep with my face to the ground. Then he touched me and raised me to my feet. He said, I'm going to tell you what will happen later in the time of wrath because the vision concerns the appointed time of the end. The two-horned ram that you saw represents the kings of Medea and Persia. The shaggy goat is the king of Greece, and the large horn between its eyes is the first king. The four horns that replace the one that was broken off represent four kingdoms that will emerge from his nation, but will not have the same power. In the latter part of their reign, when rebels have become completely wicked, and he begins to describe here... Uh, I've already talked about this stuff here as we read the description of the dream in these earlier verses, but I do want to point something out here before we move on. I want to point out that first, the defeat of the Babylonian Empire by the Medes and the Persians is being predicted here some 11 years before it actually happens. So it's, this is 11 years before it actually happens, and the defeat of the Medo-Persian Empire by the Greeks is being predicted more than 200 years before it actually happens. At the time of Daniel's dream, it would have been laughable to suggest that the Greeks posed any kind of threat to anybody. Now, if Daniel's dreams or dream was accurate about the coming invasion of the Medes and the Persians and this empire of the Greeks that would rise up, what does it suggest about its accuracy concerning other things? I would say buckle up. There are rough times ahead for this world. But the Lord will rescue those who put their hope in him. And we can have confidence in that. 
In verse 23 it says, In the latter part of their reign, when rebels have become completely wicked, a fierce-looking king, a master of intrigue, will arise. He will become very strong, but not by his own power. He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy those who are mighty, the holy people. He will cause deceit to prosper. He will consider himself superior. What they, when they feel secure, he will destroy many and take his stand against the prince of princes. Yet he will be destroyed, but not by human power. We have here both a description of Antiochus Epiphanes on a lesser scale and also a description of the final leader of human government, the Antichrist, on a larger scale. This final leader of human government will have the characteristics that are described here in these verses. Now, as we consider these characteristics, there may be certain world leaders who have come to and gone who come to your mind. Now, are one of these people the Antichrist? Well, none of us know that, obviously. But I want to say this. First, we personally don't want to have these character qualities in ourselves, And we don't want these character qualities in the leaders that we choose. Promises and accomplishments don't make up for or excuse bad behavior. People being willing to settle for promises and accomplishments over character will be how the Antichrist takes power. That's how evil despots have been able to take power throughout human history. Hitler, for example, would not have been able to come to power and do the terrible things that he did if people had not chosen promises and accomplishments over character. Let us keep that in mind. Character matters, both in ourself and in our leaders. Well, look at these characteristics of this evil leader here. It says, a fierce-looking king. This person will be a powerful ruler, full of self-confidence, arrogance, and uh, persuasive. And he will be merciless, harsh, without mercy. It says, a master of intrigue. He will be both very intelligent and deceitful. We noted a similar quality being described in a different way in chapter 7 with the little horn, which was the Antichrist, having eyes. It's the same idea here, though. He will become very strong, but not by his own power. His power will be given to him by another, Satan. He'll cause astounding devastation. He'll have decisive and terrifying victories over those who oppose him. He will use chaos as a tool and as a weapon. He will succeed in whatever he does. He will appear to be invincible. He will destroy those who are mighty, the holy people. He will destroy God's people, persecuting them terribly. He will cause deceit to prosper. He will achieve his ends through deceit and lies. Satan is the father of lies, and he will act just like his father. He will consider himself superior. He will be proud, arrogant, narcissistic. He'll think himself a god among men. When they feel secure, he will destroy many. He'll create the illusion of peace and security and then destroy many. He will be a backstabber and a betrayer. He'll take his stand against the Prince of Princes. He'll oppose and fight against the Messiah, Jesus. Yet, he will be destroyed, but not by human power. We have here the same promise given that we also were given at the end of chapter 7, that the final victory will belong to God. The Lord will save his people at the end when it all looks like things are lost for humanity. The Lord himself will step in and will intervene and save his people. 
Finally, verse 26, it says, The vision of the evenings and mornings that has been given you is true, but seal up the vision, for it concerns the distant future. I, Daniel, was worn out. I lay exhausted for several days. Then I got up and went about the king's business. I was appalled by the vision. It was beyond understanding. So this dream, it was deeply disturbing and traumatic for Daniel. It says he was worn out. He lay exhausted for several days. He was appalled. He was greatly troubled, dismayed by the vision. It was beyond understanding for him. The only thing to cheer about in this horrifying vision of the future is the saving hand of God, preserving the human race from complete self-inflicted destruction. See, this is not science fiction. This is what has really happened and is really going to happen. Now, in closing this morning, I have a couple of uh, things for us to think about. First, considering the present state of our world with all of its turmoil and trouble, it's certainly ripe for a grand answer person to step forward and bring solutions. But there's only one person who really has the answers to our troubles and has the kind of character that we can trust worthy of our allegiance, Jesus Christ. The second thing is I, I want us to think about how amazingly accurate the predictions were about the Medo-Persian Empire and the Greek Empire. More than 200 years before the Greeks conquered the Medo-Persian Empire, Daniel predicted it would happen. And that was 11 years before they were in power. See, he's, he's still sitting in Babylon at this time under the Babylonian Empire. And at the time of his prediction, the Greeks, they were a relatively small collection of independent city-states that posed little threat to anybody. Skeptics, actually, have criticized the book of Daniel, claiming that it must have been written hundreds of years later in history than during Daniel's actual lifetime because they consider it impossible for the predictions made in this book to be so accurate and detailed. Even giving the names of these future empires of the Medes, the Persians, and the Greeks. So here's the question I put before us. If Daniel's predictions were accurate about the Medo-Persian Empire and the Greek Empire, then isn't it, it reasonable to assume that his predictions about the end of human government to also be accurate? Jesus Christ is coming back one day. And it's important that each of us are ready for that day. The Bible tells us that day is going to come unexpectedly, like a thief coming in the middle of the night. 1 Thessalonians 5.1, Paul writes, Now, brothers and sisters, about times and dates, we do not need to write to you, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as a labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. In, in other words, while people are going about their lives thinking things will continue as they always have, then suddenly the day of the Lord will be here. We don't want to meet Jesus Christ for the first time at his second coming. We want to meet Jesus Christ for the first time now. He died on a cross as a sacrifice for our sins. He came back to life on the third day to give us a new life. Now an eternal life after death with him. And we can have a personal, life-changing, truly meaningful relationship with God through Jesus Christ right now by asking him to come into our life and follow him. You can do that through a very simple prayer. You can begin this life. That's not the life. It's not a magic charm. But it's a way for you to begin, for you to just pray to God yourself. God, I believe that Jesus is your son. I believe that he died for my sins. Forgive me. Cleanse me. 
Give me this new life that you have promised through Jesus. I'm going to follow you with my life. In the joke about her, Sherlock Holmes and Watson that I told at the beginning, Watson, he missed the very obvious thing that their tent had been stolen. For us, we can spend a lot of time talking about ideas of what we think certain things mean in Bible prophecy, but let's not miss the overriding important thing. Jesus is coming back. Let's be ready. Amen and amen. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the startling accuracy of these prophecies that you gave to your servant Daniel all those years ago about coming empires and kingdoms and uh, those that are still yet to be. And we can have confidence that as the ones in the past came, those still in the future are coming too. Lord, we ask that you would increase our faith, our confidence in you and your word. We ask you would fill us with hope as we look at our world and it, it seems so uncertain in so many ways, Lord, and confusing. Lord, give us the firm foundation of Jesus Christ to be our rock our security in these times, Lord. Fill our heart with peace and joy. And Lord, may we seek to do as you've called your disciples to do, Jesus, on that day just before you left, that we too would tell others that you have come to rescue us, Lord, from all of this craziness. In Jesus' name, amen.